My name's Steve Jolly, I'm a spokesman for a national campaign group called No CCTV. We campaign against uh, camera surveillance in the UK. And you can find us our website at uh, www.no-cctv.org.uk. I've worked in uh, press and PR and corporate communications in the past and had sort of, you know, corporate office jobs. And um, uh, I've never been a, a, a fan of uh, CCTV cameras. I, was, I do remember commenting to friends and girlfriends in the past that they seemed to be everywhere and they were quite intrusive and didn't really feel I should be videoed and watched wherever I went. But uh, other than that, I hadn't really looked into the subject much. and. Um, really had um, much in involvement in it as an issue until something happened uh, last year in Birmingham which kind of um, l led me uh, to research more and find out more about the subject and really realise that something was wrong and, and, and to, to get involved and campaign against it. In April 2010 uh, just a couple of hundred yards from here, uh, a camera post, uh, a, a big metal post for a CCTV camera, just appeared one day. I went away to visit some friends, came back, and this thing had appeared while I was away. And at first I thought it was a mistake because it was in a really odd place. It was a quiet sort of residential side street, really. There was a junction there, but it didn't appear to be have anything to do with speeding or... Um, I couldn't work, work out why a surveillance camera had been put there and you normally, you, there are places where you kind of, you see them and, and, and you, you don't really question why they're there, you know, perhaps outside where the pubs are or in the shopping centres and we, we've become used to them, haven't we? But this struck me as odd because it was a residential area and I sort of made a mental note, I stopped and looked at it and kind of interrogated it and thought, what are you doing there? What? You know, so it was a mystery, and that's how it began. It was a mystery, and I thought, I want to get to the bottom of this. I got home and had an email from a councillor who said he'd had a number of inquiries, and that there are about eight of these posts in just the the area where I live, and that those camera posts were the tip of the iceberg. They were part of a much bigger project called Project Champion, and. Nobody was told about this surveillance project, um, nobody was asked, there was no consultation, N even the local councillors weren't involved, and in fact the local police station knew nothing about it. So there was this sort of deepening mystery, there seemed to be this secrecy, and when we found out who was behind it, it was this, uh, the Safer Birmingham Partnership, which is um, the police, the council and other organisations who... Um, they have sort of community safety schemes and crime reduction schemes which always involve surveillance cameras. That's basically their, their, their proposed solution to any problems, whether it be antisocial behaviour or vehicle crime. And they said they'd got a grant from the Home Office, which struck me as really odd because firstly it was odd that cameras were being put in residential areas where I wouldn't expect to see them. And secondly, that the central government was paying for this. And it sound, sounded very much to me like Big Brother snooping on citizens, you know, very uh, sort of 1984. And uh, it, the more I looked into it, the worse it got. There were 216 cameras, mostly automatic number plate recognition cameras, ANPR. There was about 38 CCTV cameras, but shockingly there were 72 secret spy cameras. These were what they call covert cameras, so they were hidden in secret locations that weren't being disclosed. And we were just told that this was for our safety and benefit. So there was definitely something wrong and we weren't being told the truth. And then I discovered that the, uh, the money, three and a half million pounds for this scheme, didn't just come from a Home Office grant, it came from uh, it was given by the Home Office to the Association of Chief Police Officers, ACPO, and a specific uh, committee that they have called ACPO TAM, and the TAM stands for Terrorism and Allied Matters. And they basically asked the Home Office for £3.5 million 
to set up a surveillance scheme to spy on Muslims in Birmingham because they, they deemed that if you were a Muslim, well, you might be a terrorist, therefore we need to keep a close eye on you. But obviously this wasn't the story that was conveyed to the public. That was quite a different story that was put forward, and it was actually a cover story. So from the beginning we were lied to, and I very, very quickly discovered this and realised that this was a massive deception, that the police were lying to people and that it was nothing to do with vehicle crime or antisocial behaviour or community safety and it was everything to do with spying on 90,000 people who happened to live in two distinct communities in Birmingham, Asian areas uh, that had a mainly Muslim population and because they were deemed to be a terrorist threat. So I, I clearly saw this as, a, as an injustice, something that was wrong. To, to make suspects out of 90,000 people simply because of what God they pray to. You know, not because of anything they've done, but because of their religious faith. And I thought, well, you know, they might start with the Muslims, and then who next? It'll be, what, the Chinese, the Somalians? Or will it be uh, working-class council estates? Or will it be just be everywhere? So I thought that this, you know, they might be able to get away with it, and they, could, they might try and justify it on terrorism grounds... But eventually, it would be all of us under surveillance, everywhere we go. I decided to blow the whistle. So just to start shouting about it, to tell everyone. Because I, I thought that people would agree that this was blatantly wrong. But, I needed, but people didn't know about it, so I needed to tell people. So um, I did initially get lots of support from local councillors. It was around the time of a local election, so it was kind of made into an election issue to try and win support from, from those communities. Um, but there was also a, you know, a, um, a principled belief that this was wrong. So it wasn't just a cynical um, political uh, gimmick. A lot of councillors felt very strongly that, you know, not only had they not been consulted at all, but it was just morally wrong and possibly illegal. And uh, it was an outrage. And we had... We first had, I mean, I set up a Facebook group, first of all, um, simply because it's easy and you can spread information that way. I set up a blog, so I started writing about what was going on. Um, got a couple of stories in the local newspaper about it where I was quoted as saying, you know, that I was, I was opposed to this, I was against it, and explaining why, and really casting doubt on the story that we'd been told, you know, because it wasn't true. Um, but I thought, you know, we really need to go big with this one because the local paper initially treated it as a local story. You know, some local people are complaining about these cameras. And they didn't really see the significance of it. So I went to The Guardian and they were really interested and they, I gave them all, all, the, um, all the names and numbers and details and they checked it out and they interviewed people who came up here and um, it was all absolutely true, everything that I'd said. Uh, I wrote an article for the local magazine, probably has about a few hundred readers, but I wanted to get local debate stimulated, so I, want people to, I wanted people to write into the magazine um, and tell us what they thought. But I, tried, I just tried as much publicity as I could. I wanted everyone to know, so I, I went to Liberty as well, and they were very interested because they said this... this seems illegal you know this seems to be in breach of the human rights act and quite possibly the regulation of investigatory powers act and the data protection act and also the fact that there's been no consultation and if the police have lied about it then you know that's a very strong case for a legal challenge and they did actually file for a judicial review for a high court judge to determine whether or not it was legal and um that was probably a factor in, in what eventually happened, which was that the, the police capitulated and realised that they couldn't get away with it. And they backed down and said, we've um, made some mistakes here. We'll, we'll take those cameras down and you know, hopefully we can win back the trust of the Muslim community that was outraged and up in arms about it. Yeah, so... So that's a kind of fantastic, fantastic victory, yeah? Brilliant. I mean, it's a landmark victory for, for civil liberties and, and against surveillance because it's, I don't think it's ever been done before. Cameras always get put in. You never hear about them being taken down. 
you know, it just doesn't happen. So this is this is really a first, and it was that experience really that, that led me to looking at other surveillance schemes in, you know, in the wider context of it all, uh, and 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 the facts behind the the, the the sort of perceived wisdom that that we we accept through the, the the news media and general popular opinion. So I was really looking into the facts of, especially national strategies and policies about where this is heading and that's where it gets really alarming. Well the official line that's put forward by local authorities and the police and these partnerships um, is always that it's for crime prevention so they, they claim that it might help deter or prevent crime uh, and they also claim that it helps identify offenders and therefore secure prosecutions so it takes criminals off the streets. It also takes um, you know, drivers off the road if they haven't got tax or insurance and this sort of thing. These, these, this is what they claim and, and you know, they always often tend to pick the sorts of crimes that are really truly abhorrent to, to people that, that, that kind of play on emotions and fear. So they'll, they'll talk about rape, drug addicts, uh, dr drug pushers and um, murder and, and, and catching these sorts of bad guys. So on the face of it, it sounds like, well, you know, that's good, surely, for society, what's not to like. Um, and anyone who objects to the invasion of privacy and the intrusion into their daily lives by being filmed, um, the, the, the doctrine th that's put forward is always, if you've got nothing to hide, then you've got nothing to worry about. Um, so that... that is kind of an argument, which I think is a spurious argument. It's, it's used to counter any legitimate concerns about civil liberties. Um, it simply suggests that if you can prove you're not doing anything wrong, then, well, you shouldn't be concerned at all, should you? Because if you're not doing anything wrong, then you're OK. Uh, it kind of suggests that the surveillance is, is only being done to, to, to bad people doing bad things. But of course it isn't, it's being done to everybody all the time. Uh, and we're, we're told we shouldn't mind. But I think it has huge implications for liberty and freedom for, you know, on a fundamental level. Because we're a common law country, we're, you know, we have that common law tradition that has the presumption of innocence. So you're presumed innocent uh, until proven guilty by a court of law, beyond reasonable doubt. So everyone's given the benefit of, of, it, of that doubt. So, you know, if there's no suspicion to, to think that you, you uh, might be committing some sort of crime, then you, you should be allowed to freely come and go and not be interfered with or questioned or stopped or interrogated or investigated in some way. But what constant surveillance does, it effectively interferes with that right and it places you under investigation and makes you prove that you're not doing anything wrong. So by that same token, we should welcome the police to uh, randomly search your home. Because why would you mind if you're not hiding anything illegal? By that same logic, why would you mind? You know, you, you can easily prove that you're not doing anything wrong. You can allow the police to search your home and they will say, yes, you, you're all clean. We have found nothing illegal. And you're free to carry on about your daily lives. But most people draw the line when it comes to freedom, liberty, civil liberties. Most people draw that line at the front door. So they say, oh, I wouldn't have cameras in my home. Absolutely not. But oh, outside, um, they don't seem to object. So the logical consequence of that is that they will be everywhere except inside your threshold. But the argument is always 100% positive. These are a good thing for society, for safety for catching criminals and why would anyone possibly object? That's, that's the, the message that constantly put forward. No CCTV uh, often point to the, the definitive um, study that was done a couple of years ago. Uh, it was actually in 2008 and it was um, commissioned by the Home Office and the National Policing Improvement Agency. And it was carried out by uh, a research group called the Campbell Collaboration. And it was intended to be an exhaustive, com um, comprehensive, authoritative study, you know, to really get to the bottom of how does CCTV affect crime? Does it help? Does it, you know, does it deter crime? Does it, does it catch criminals? 
is it do we you know how can we actually prove we measure how good it is or, or whether it's good or not and that was what they set out to do so they began with about 100 evaluations that have been done all around the country and I think possibly some from um, outside the UK in different situations so public transport shopping centres car parks um, whatever situation you can think of where surveillance cameras are used and they really basically took every bit of data that had been gathered and assessed it with a, with a very rigorous academic, to a rigorous academic standard. And this took a long time, and this was a very in-depth study. And its key conclusion in its findings, you know, if I could say in a sentence, because it's obviously a longish report, but the, the key finding was that CCTV does not have a significant effect on crime. Now, that's a shocker, because everyone thinks it does. Now, if the most exhaustive and definitive study ever done says that it makes no difference to crime, then why are we continuing with the policy? You know, why aren't we rolling back this costly, failed experiment? <clears throat> that's, that's, yes, that's, so that's a big question, and I, I, it's not one I can really answer, no, because, no. you know, we, we've, ass we've assessed we, we, that the, the policy isn't working, you know, but we're told it's to fight crime. And if it doesn't do that, then why are we still continuing with it? But there is a very strong uh, strategy and policy of continuing with the proliferation and expansion of surveillance camera networks. And we, we know this because all the documents are published and you know, it's all in the public domain. So we know the government's intention is to pursue this, this course of action, even though their own evidence um, didn't support that that. That, um, that strategy. In fact, it, it, it proved that it wasn't working. Uh, so this is not what the public understands, you see, because the public has a completely different perception. There's this massive gulf of disparity between the facts about CCTV in relation to crime and what people think, what the general public thinks. And that's because the public gets its information from programmes like Crime Watch uh, and even... Um, non-factual television programmes like The Bill, uh, newspapers who also strangely seem to be very pro-CCTV, as if it's we're, we're working with the police to help protect our community. And they don't tend not to question CCTV as an approach. So we're bombarded with messages which say it's good and it works, even though the evidence says it doesn't work. So having established that it's not effective, the answer from the authorities and, and the police is often, well, it will be effective or more effective when we upgrade the cameras and when we put more cameras up. So the answer to, to, to the suggestion that CCTV doesn't cut crime is to add more CCTV, which again seems a bit strange. So it's a one-way street, it's pushing in this one direction. Um, and when groups like ours, like No CCTV, say, well, hang on a minute, you've got to look where, we're, where this is leading and what sort of society we'll end up with when we get there, what will that look like? You know, will, we, will we actually be free people? You know, will, it, will it be a free and open society if, if you can't do anything without being recorded and possibly databased in some way? I know that's not a verb, but, you know, to be... <clears throat> monitored and recorded on a database because cameras are very soon going to be linked up to um, other sources of information and this has been done already with vehicles and it will soon be done with facial recognition technology and that's that's there's a couple of quite uh, quite worrying developments that are we're already moving into on, with the vehicle recognition but very soon the facial recognition and um, the implications for, for freedom are, are massive and yet when people voice those concerns they, they tend to be dismissed as either troublemakers or um, um, a minority group that has a sort of extreme opinion so that, that those concerns are always downplayed whilst trumpeting 
this this idea that um, CCTV is good, CCTV cuts crime, CCTV makes us safe, and then you know playing on the fear uh, fear of say mugging or you know violent crime and and this will keep you safe and protect you from that. So it's really pushing against the tide to suggest that there's a problem with this obsession with surveillance. But there's definitely a problem. To bring us up to date of where we are, how we got here and where we're heading, um, Britain has pioneered the use of CCTV cameras and surveillance cameras um, more so than any other country. We've got, there is dispute as to how many we've got because nobody really knows. Previous estimate that was often quoted was 4.2 million cameras. Now recently the Association of Chief Police Officers has tried to rubbish that and say, well we did a study and we, we, we calculated that, that that's completely wrong and there's only 1.8 million. Um, I suspect it may be somewhere between the two figures, but we, do, we don't really know. But that's not really, the number of cameras isn't really um, the point because it, the number is always increasing. It doesn't decrease. It's always, we're always adding more and more cameras. But we've got more cameras than any other country in the world. And we're a small country, but we've got more cameras than China, which is a totalitarian one-party police state. Now, China's catching up with us. Um, there's a city in China that's just installed half a million CCTV cameras in one city. And what it's looking like is that CCTV um, will become a form of public utility like the fifth utility. It'll be like electricity. So wherever, wherever you go where there's electricity will be, will be on camera. So you know, there's nowhere that will be off grid from the surveillance network unless you go out into the middle of the forest where there's no electricity and there's no street lighting or anything then you probably won't find any cameras there in the forest. But as soon as you go to a population centre, even a small village, or as soon as you drive a car on the road you will be back on the network. And we're seeing this with the net network of ANPR cameras, the number plate recognition cameras. Um, they've been quietly put up all over the country along the motorway network. And I, th I think the, the strategy is, is eventually to have them about once one, one camera every 400 metres. Every petrol station um, will have one. I think any new petrol station has to have them and petrol stations are being encouraged, shall we say, by the police to install them. And a lot of them already have it because they, they think it will help with petrol drive-offs. Um, but what it means is that even if you're driving around and there are no cameras, as soon as you go to fill up somewhere, then your, your whereabouts and your number plate will be recorded and that is run through the police computer, the criminal, criminal police computer, you know, the National Police Database, um, the Vehicle Insurance Database, the DVLA Database. A lot of these databases are wrong. Um, I mean, some of them, um, 30 or 40 percent of the time. Um, so you can get pulled over because the computer says no, when in fact the computer is wrong. But, you know, you, you would have to explain to the police that please don't seize my vehicle and arrest me because your computer information is wrong. Um, I think it's likely that police, the police are more likely to, to, to trust the information of their computer than your denial, your protestations of innocence. But not only the road network and the petrol stations, we've got number plate cameras now forming uh, what they call the ring of steel around towns and cities. Now, the Project Champion scheme in, in Birmingham surrounded the Muslim communities with a ring of steel, or two rings of steel in two distinct areas. Um, we're now seeing that, that same model being rolled out across the country. So uh, the town of Royston in Cambridgeshire was the first to announce it, proudly announced that they were entirely protected by this ring of cameras. A couple of weeks later, Peterborough followed suit. So we now have the Peterborough ring of steel. And we, we obviously already have the London ring of steel, which is the congestion charging zone, originally set up for road charging but almost straight away the police were given access to that because obviously it's an investigative tool for them and um, you know they, they, they say it it's also helps with counter-terrorism etc. So what we're seeing is, is these cameras that they don't just take a picture of an anonymous 
person. Um, they basically run your number plate through the computer and check against various databases and they keep a record of all your car journeys and where you've been for up to five years. Now, a lot of this data is being managed by private companies and the one that, Hart that runs Hertfordshire Police Service, their AMPR system, has published documents that have, they're saying they're advising and encouraging the police to make more use of the 98% of data that's harvested, um, which currently they don't use. So they only use about 2% of it. That 2% is people that the police are wanting to talk to. They're perhaps wanted by the police for a crime or they're a suspect of crime. The other 98% is all the innocent people who've done nothing wrong. But increasingly the police are being urged by private companies and are coming round to the idea, um, or perhaps maybe always intended that that would be the case, but what they're starting to do is, is to investigate people who have committed no crime because there is the, the idea that eventually, if you watch everybody closely enough all the time, eventually you'll catch somebody doing something. Um, that's a bit worrying because if, you have, if, you've no, if there is no suspicion of crime, to be investigated as a matter of course seems rather unjust. And we've had cases where protesters have had their car flagged on the AMPR system simply for attending peaceful protests. So they've had a, a code put against their registration plate as protester. So you, your car could be flagged up as protester or domestic extremist, or potential terrorist, or drug dealer. And these things could be done without your knowledge. You, you may never have been charged with any offence or even stopped and questioned by the police. So your identity could have been flagged up as potentially suspicious. And there are people who simply by attending protests have found that they've been pulled over by the police 25 times in two years, given different explanations, and then eventually found out that their car had been flagged as a protester which isn't an offence. Yeah. So it's very worrying because it relies on a total trust in government and the state for it to be benign and work to protect you and help you. And, there, you know, people tend not to consider that, that these very powerful tools could potentially become tools of persecution for either groups like the Muslims in Birmingham or individual people like uh, pr protesters and activists and just people with political opinions who've broken no law. So then we're getting into the realm of, of what you might expect to see in a country like China. With, as I said, a totalitarian one-party state where the police uh, and the, the government can just throw you in jail uh, without trial. Of course, that wouldn't happen here, would it? Oh, it does. I think it does. It does. So it's worrying because... It's, um, it gives more and more power to the state and, and it's, it's, it's placing a greater burden of trust on us. We have, to, we have to grant more and more trust in the police and the authorities and the government not to abuse this power. And while it may, it may only be slightly naive that at the moment we totally trust the government not to abuse this power, not to, to increase it and to use it for purposes other than, you know, the stated aims... But I think only a fool would imagine that in 50 or 100 years' time and every government after this one would always be benign and have the best interests of the population at heart. You know, we are creating a huge control grid that can be used for persecution, social control, um, that can interfere with freedom of movement. And we're not batting an eyelid and we're, we're not really considering who, whose hands it might be in and what they might do with it. There is a concern about private companies getting involved in surveillance. I mean, we've already had the concern about local authorities using REPA, RIPA, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, to spy on people for trivial things like dog fouling the pavement or putting the bins out on the wrong time. These are anti-terror laws that are being used by local authorities. But I think it's even more worrying pr uh, private companies getting involved in what is becoming the surveillance industrial complex. Um, for instance, we have, um, it, it, coming back to the Project Champion scheme in Birmingham, the scheme 
was largely outsourced by West Midlands Police and the West Midlands Counter-Terrorism Unit to a private company, uh, what you might call um, a, a global risk and security consultancy. Um, now that covers a sort of multitude of, of areas and the, the, this company was called the Olive Group and they're a massive group um, involved in all sorts of activities. Basically they provide security for governments and private corporations around the world, often in war zones. So we're talking about Iraq and Afghanistan, places of conflict. So they would work for oil companies, but also do force protection. So they would do armed military sort of um, security work. So it's not just, um, you know, it's not just sort of civilian applications. It, it's very much involved in the military side of things. Um, this company, the Olive Group, were, they won a tender. It was a secret tender, so it wasn't advertised in any um, trade magazines. But they won the tender to, to basically design and install the Project Champion camera system in Birmingham. So they, they worked out which areas they wanted to spy on, what would be the best locations to put the cameras in, where to put the number plate cameras, where to put the CCTV cameras, and where to place the hidden covert cameras. They did it all very stealthily. I think it was all done overnight. You know, hardly anybody witnessed it being installed. But this this company, um, they do all sorts of other activities. They do disaster response, and um, uh, they do mock terror drills. You know, mock terrorism drills as to how to manage uh, your disaster response if there were to be a a terrorist bombing incident or something. They also do uh, training for kidnap scenarios. Uh, all sorts of areas which uh, sound quite nefarious and kind of in, in the sort of, the sort of semi-secret world of the intelligence services. And so th they, were, they, were, they were basically contracted to, to carry out this surveillance of the, of the Muslim population in Birmingham. And they were made to f sign the Official Secrets Act, so it was a complete secret, their involvement, and when they, when they did what they did. <clears throat> and then when they handed it over to the police, then it was sort of just briefly mentioned to the public as, uh, oh, it's just a safety thing to catch criminals, don't worry about it. When in, in fact, it was you know, a secret operation done by a private military contractor involved in intelligence and overseas security uh, and all sorts of... Um, Activities that you know you don't imagine would overlap with your local police force. Another worrying development of the, the the sort of private companies getting involved in this surveillance industrial complex is the the use of drones, the use of UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. We have BAE Systems, who have developed a drone called the Herti drone, H E R T I. And it's basically a bit like the Predator and Reaper drones that the Americans have. But uh, instead of being fitted with missiles, it's fitted with sort of military-grade CCTV surveillance cameras. And these things can, can hover silently um, 20,000 feet away. You won't see them or hear them, but they can um, read the newspaper over your shoulder. That's, that's, how, that's how good the cameras are. I mean, we're talking about... You know, it's not megapixels anymore. It's sort of, you know, I don't know, giga, terra, pixel. It's military technology, so it doesn't... It's, it's, it's sort of years and years ahead of the stuff that, that we use in our daily lives. Now, they're already in partnership with... Um, or they're working with Kent Police uh, in, a, in a group called the South Coast Partnership. <clears throat> and they're, they're, they're working towards or they're testing or trialling the use of these drones for domestic civilian surveillance. And now, they say it's to do with you know, protecting our borders. Um, but they're also talking about using it for civilian police policing, and not for na matters of national security, like terrorism, um, which is the one that they usually, they usually trot out as justification for any, any form of surveillance. They say terrorism, and that somehow justifies it in their view. No, they're talking about, oh, it could be useful for all sorts of purposes, even trivial things like parking on a WL line. So 
you know, we could have, we could see these, we could have these drones, which you wouldn't see or hear, um, watching us from the sky, just seeing what they can, what they can see, you know, and, and obviously because they're not fixed on posts by the roadside, you know, they can be directed anywhere. You, all they're waiting for is clearance from the civil, civil aviation authority. Once they get clearance to fly at a particular height, uh, we may find that the sky, the sky may be full of them in a few years' time. But we, we've put freedom of information requests in, or, or people have um, asked for this information. You know, what, what is the government? What are the government's plans on the use of drones for civilian surveillance? And like much of these questions about strategy and policy, the, 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 there's there's um, sort of no comment, because we can't tell you anything yet. So what we do know is that the government, the state, the police, local authorities are really pushing ahead with, with the, this, this sort of obsession with surveillance. Um, and the British public has largely been sold on the idea that this is a good thing. But unfortunately they're, they're, they're not only uninformed, they're misinformed and I really hope that some, some people watching this will go to our website and look at some of the information about what's really going on, because it's quite worrying. And the next thing that's coming in uh, is facial recognition technology. And it actually states this in the Protection of Freedoms Bill. I was invited down to Parliament to give my views on this new legislation, or regulation I should say. And in the Surveillance Camera Code of Practice, it actually says that uh, we're on the cusp of a, a digital revolution in CCTV technology. And it, it, it says that facial recognition technology, well, not just that, but analytical software linked to cameras. So the cameras will now be linked to software which analyzes the images and possibly linked to databases. So they're, they're becoming something much more and much bigger than they were. And apparently facial, facial recognition technology will become an accepted part of our CCTV landscape, which is a phrase used in the document, which I find worrying because to me that is data rape. It's identity rape. I mean, if you have an interaction with, with a, say, a policeman and you're asked to show ID of some kind and you might say, OK, uh, here's my driving license and you've consented to uh, to that transaction but if your identity is taken from you by a camera somewhere that takes your picture of your face and runs it through a computer and recognizes your name and your address and your telephone number your email address and perhaps you know could scan your Facebook account go through your your uh, link that to your vehicle details your insurance your bank account your health records I mean that's not being done at the moment but these are the concerns. That's, that's the sort of world we're heading into. Uh, but I think people really need to wake up and see these dangers that are coming our way and realise that they've been missold on this, this dream of safety and crime prevention. Because, you know, what, what we could end up could be quite a dark place where um, we've redefined what freedom is. You're free to come and go as long as we film everything you do investigate you perpetually uh, and, um, and record everything indefinitely uh, as evidence of everything you've ever done in case it might be of use to us in the future. That doesn't sound like freedom to me. That sounds like the tool of a totalitarian one-party state like China. But to make that comparison, most people would scoff and say, but we live in a free democratic society. And yet we have this control system, which is, which even uh, the Chinese government probably envies and is trying to emulate. Well, there are things that people can do, and um, you know we, the people, can stop the surveillance state. But the problem is that people aren't aware of what's going on; they're not challenging it, and that implied consent, that tacit approval, is what's giving it the green light to go ahead. And, and in fact, MPs and councillors see it as a big vote winner because they tap into this public support for CCGV, which has been engineered and manufa manufactured. I mean, you know, we've, we've, we've heard of Noam, Noam Chomsky's term, manufacturing consent. And that's what I think has happened with CCGV. 
uh, over a period of several years, perhaps 10 or 15 years, we have accepted, we've been given the impression that CCTV is a great thing for, for our safety, security and to, to catch criminals, uh, despite the evidence that's not true. And it's been accepted as a, as a, as a path, a direction, a strategy, a policy. And we've continued with that for a couple of decades now. And we're really into, it's just touching into phase two, where it's going to be upgraded and become more, um, more sort of almost military technology involved. But people aren't aware. People are sort of asleep on this. They, 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 they don't see it as a concern or that there could be any potential dangers or problems. So we really need to raise awareness and let people know the facts. And uh, they should go to No CCTV because... There's more factual research on our site than they're going to find by looking at uh, the mainstream media or other sources of information, you know, where people tend to get their ideas about CCTV from. So, you know, they can go to, uh, it's uh, www.no-cctv.org.uk and uh, it's a wealth of information there. But... Often it can be challenged at a local level, as we showed here in Birmingham, because these things tend to be implemented at a local level. So uh, I, I'm not suggesting that there's, there's um, a clear and obvious master plan to saturate the country in surveillance cameras, but it's done on a local level with local support by local councillors, and it wins votes for them because it seems popular. So they say, oh, I'll get you CCTV, you know. Yeah, that's popular. And so people give that the thumbs up. As if people locally said, well, OK, prove it works, prove there's a need for it, and prove that um, we shouldn't be concerned about the infringements on freedom and liberty and privacy, and give them the facts and the argument. If you, if you ask for a public consultation, if you ask for an informed debate, and if you challenge this accepted, perceived view that everything is okay with it. Often you can, you can, you can overturn it. In addition to Project Champion, which was a really massive scheme, it made big headlines, it was all over the world. I mean, we had news crews from Japan, the Middle East, we had Canadian journalists, it was on Al Jazeera Press TV, even a Russian channel came and, and did a piece on it. It was, it was you know, it was, a, it was an international news story. But when, when that uh, was over, when the police said, OK, you know, this has caused us such a problem that we can't use these cameras now, that the cover's been blown. We'll take them down and say sorry and um, we'll all just forget about that episode. Immediately after that, my local councillor thought it'd be a great idea to put cameras up in um, the, the neighbourhood where I live and he thought that this would be a vote winner, which is strange because it's so close to the opposition to Project Champion to suggest putting more cameras in did seem a little unwise, but he was confident that people supported it and that I was in a minority view. So I said, well, let's have a public debate, let's have a public consultation, let's have a public meeting where people can get together and actually discuss these views in public and um, have it all out in the open and uh, publicise it and um, we'll see what other people think rather than just a handful of councillors in a back room saying, great, we're going to put cameras up. And in doing that, we had a public meeting and there were loads of people against the idea. They were saying, well, prove it works. Prove we need it. We haven't even got high crime here. Why do we need cameras? But the councillor said, he just seemed to think it was an enhancement to any area, so it would, it would just be a general improvement. So even if you had no crime, he would still want to put them up because it was somehow an additional benefit. So, you know, we had an informed debate. You know, I brought facts and um, some reality into the debate, uh, referenced and sourced, and I could prove what I was saying. And um, a lot of people were agreeing with me, saying, well, if you haven't got any data that proves that, that uh, this has an effect on crime, if you can't prove we need it, you know, if there isn't a problem to which cameras are the solution, why are you putting it up? And... Um, we filmed that, all that and put it on, the, uh, on YouTube. Uh, there's a public meeting about that. And um, we had a sort of local poll survey and more than 50% of people said, no, we don't want it. So the, the local councillors 
who, let's not forget, we elect to represent us, they had to abandon the idea. They said, OK, people don't want it. So that's, you know, it's as simple as that, really. You've just got to get involved at a local level and challenge it. And also just challenge this notion that everyone loves it and there isn't a problem with it and it's all OK. And you can do that by using facts. So, but... Are the facts on your website, sorry? They are. The facts are on this website. And they're all sourced and referenced to the documents, the evidence. So it's not just opinion. It's not just a bunch of people saying, we don't like cameras. Um, there's an awful lot of academic research that's gone into the information on that website. And uh, it's all backed up by factual evidence. But often we find that, uh, you know, although we have the factual evidence, um, that's being countered by a more sort of emotional, irrational argument. Um, but, you know, we need to get over this, this perceived wisdom, which is wrong. We need to get the facts to people. We need to show them that there's much more to this than meets the eye. And, uh, you know, it's not something we should just accept as part of the national infrastructure. Uh, surveillance isn't like electricity. It isn't something that we all need everywhere we go. It's um, there's a lot of there's a lot of, a lot of danger p attached to it. And um, if people start to see where where it's heading and where it might lead, then they would object. And I think they will object just to facial recognition software. When that starts to come in, people are going to say, "What?" And you explain what it does and how it works, and they'll be incredulous with disbelief. And they won't believe it's happening, because it sounds like something from a, a science fiction movie. But no, it is happening. And I think that might be something that starts to wake people up a bit, that, that there is something wrong. And also the, n the number plate cameras, which is a national network, uh, was put up without any legislation. So we have a, we, we have the, a partial, you know, it's not completed yet, but it's, it's, it's being built rapidly. A national, nationwide vehicle tracking network that was put up with no law to enable it. You know, the previous Home Secretary and the previous Information Commissioner, or no, Surveillance Commissioner, expressed concern that there was no law that covered it, so it wasn't really legal. <laughs> so now the police or the, the Association of Chief Police Officers and, and, and the Home Office perhaps are saying, well, well, let's introduce some legislation that would make it lawful. So retrospectively, after the event, the government may change the law to, 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 to say that that's now OK. But, you know, where was the public debate? Where was the um, parliamentary debate? Where, you know, these things are being done sort of under the radar without our knowledge. And the, despite the talk of transparency, there's actually a lot of secrecy. So, you know, that's why that's another reason why people don't know much about it, because we're not meant to. We're, we're just meant to see the positive side, which is your local high street has put up some cameras after an incident and now there won't be any more burglaries or, you know, everybody's happy. But there's a lot more to it than that. So people need to get clued up. People need to find out the facts and, and challenge it and say, well, no, you know, we're, we're not in favour because it's that implied consent, that tacit support. And if nobody says anything then it goes ahead, because we allow it. If nobody objects, then it happens. So, you know, all it takes is a few people in a few local areas to, to, to get up a little local group, whether it be a blog or, a, or a, you know, a Facebook page or, or get a group of people together locally, you know, get the story in the local newspaper, because they always love a bit of a row. Local newspapers, you know, if there's a group of residents that disagree with the council or, um, you know, over an issue like surveillance cameras... Um, then, you know, get that in the local paper. Get, discuss it on the local radio. You know, this is what these local media are for. You know, they want to know what's happening in the community, so give them something to cover. You know, get them to debate the issue, but get the facts in there. So anyone can do it. It's just, it seems to be an issue that people haven't really considered. Um, you know, it seems to be kind of accepted as, as if it's always been there. And it's very slowly, incrementally, been built up gradually. And now we're seeing cameras in buses, trains, taxis, 
pubs, restaurants, schools, and even toilets. You know, at what point are we going to say, enough is enough? It's, we've gone wrong here. Society, we change, we're turning society into a sort of open prison, and we've made a terrible, terrible mistake. Um, we need to, we need to get, we need to get to that point now, and not wait until it's too late, and not wait until. You know, it is effectively a, a panopticon of total surveillance. So there are things that people could do, but we just need to get them to wake up and realise that, that something's wrong. I think that the code of practice um, is really an enabling act which um, enables the proliferation and expansion use of surveillance cameras. Um, it's concerned mainly with technical standards to do with compatibility uh, and networking of systems and uh, as described in the code it's designed to be an A to Z manual of how to get the most out of your camera systems. It doesn't appear to have anything to do with protecting the rights of the individual. There's nothing in there about protect protection from surveillance. There is more cautionary information in this document from 1994, um, which, which um, does, does warn about the potential um, negative impacts on society that CCTV may have. Uh, it points out the drawbacks and the, um, the extent to which it, it could often fail to live up to expectations. So this document from 17 years ago is much more measured. Than, than what we're seeing in this document today. Sir, so, could you just uh, tell us what exactly that document is? Um, this is a Home Office <coughs> guidance document called CCTV Looking Out For You. And that was 1994? That was 94. Thank you very much. Sorry to have interrupted you. And um, we seem to have gone backwards in our thinking since then. So the technology has advanced dramatically and incredibly rapidly. But the thinking on how to um, govern the issues of personal privacy and, and personal freedoms haven't moved with it. In fact, if anything, they've gone backwards. Mr. Ellison referred to the Campbell collaboration earlier on, and uh, I think it's a great shame that that, that report, which was highly significant in um, illustrating the ineffectiveness of CCTV, um, was missed by the Lords Constitutional Committee. Um, and the report that they did into citizens and surveillance. It came out just after their, their debate and their report, but uh, it would have had a huge impact on their report because the Campbell Collaboration's key finding was that CCTV schemes in city and town centres and public housing, as well as those focused on public transport, did not have a significant effect on crime. And that wasn't a, uh, just a one-off amongst the research. There, it, it echoed and reinforced much of the previous research that, that preceded it. But this is not what the British public understands about the CCTV. They are constantly told that it works. They're told in the media every single day there will be at least one story about um, uh, in connection with CCTV, which gives the impression that this is how we fight crime now. There's a huge gulf of disparity between the public perception of CCTV and its actual capabilities. And this has been, I would say, promoted by successive governments because, for whatever reason, it's been seen as a, either a generally good thing for society or a popular thing uh, for, for MPs, councillors and ministers. And um, I don't think it's being driven by factual reality. And I think we really need to, if we're going to have consultation with the public, then we need to make sure that the public is properly... Going back to Lord Peston's comments, he said, If the public want these CCTV cameras, and my ad hoc experience is that that is true, what is the correct response to that that those of us in public life, not least the government, should give? Should we say, if that is what they want, then that is what they ought to have, even though it's not backed by any evidence at all, or is it our duty to educate them and tell them that they are wrong? I certainly believe that if all CCTV cameras do is reassure you when you should not regard them as doing so, then somebody ought to say to you, why don't you think about it a little bit and realise that you're mistaken?